On Science Fantastic, we profile the amazing, jaw-dropping scientific discoveries which are revolutionizing our world and touching our lives. And in this hour, once again, we're going to throw the lines open because this hour is for you, you, the listener. How many times have you been watching the TV, listening to the radio, surfing the web, and something captures your imagination about science, something about space, about astronomy, about DNA, about health, about cancer research, about everyday things that grab your attention, but you have nobody to talk to. You're all by yourself watching the TV, surfing the web. You're all by yourself. Well, you can talk to me. That's right. You can give me a call by calling 612 564 8135. And you can get on Science Fantastic. That's right. Write that number down. 612-564-8135. And maybe your thoughts can be heard on national radio. Just leave your name, call letters of the radio station if you're listening to one, and the city you're calling from, and then ask away. Make that comment, make that question, and just maybe you can get on national radio. Let's say you're talking to the kids at dinner time, and the kids have a science question, a homework question, and it leaves you stumped. What are you going to do? You're going to get to the telephone and call 612-564-8135. And why don't you put them on the telephone? Why don't you have them ask that question and have that science question heard on national radio? And some people say, come on, I can't do that. I'm too shy. Well, then send me email. Email address, well, first of all, go to my website, mkaku.org, m-k-a-k-u.org, and find out what I'm up to. I've written four New York Times bestsellers. The latest one is called The Future of Humanity, about the future of humanity in outer space as we conquer the universe. So find out more about my work by going to my website, mkaku.org, or my Facebook site at Michio Kaku. And on Facebook, we have over 3 million fans on Facebook. We have over 650,000 fans on Twitter. So find out what all the excitement is about by going to my website and calling that number, 612-564-8135. Okay, well, let's jump right into the first listener phone call. Hi, Dr. Kaku. My name is Lance Rome. I'm calling from Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I listen to you through your website. I was just wondering, what would happen if two big bangs were to collide against each other? I want to eventually write a science fiction book just for fun, and as an attack, that would... Uh, be something I'm curious about. So, wonder what you were thinking about two big bangs colliding each other. What happens in the middle? Thank you. Well, it turns out that I asked that very same question to my colleague Alan Guth of MIT, who may eventually win the Nobel Prize for the inflation theory of the Big Bang. Now, it turns out that the Big Bang theory has to have a small correction to it when you start to make it into a quantum theory, because if the Big Bang happened once, it's a quantum theory, it can happen again. There's a certain probability that it can happen again and again and again, meaning that our universe is a bubble of some sort, but it can spin off baby bubbles like in a bubble bath. And then I asked him a question. Let's say you create a tiny wormhole in an oven. You make an oven in a laboratory, heat it up to a fantastic temperature, trillions, trillions of degrees, much hotter than a supernova. At that point, a baby bubble, a baby universe begins to form, and it begins to expand. And then I said to him, what happens if a Big Bang happens in your living room or in your oven? And he very correctly said he's done the calculation. <laughs> That's right. You can actually see it in the scientific literature. He said the following. 
First of all, if you heat up space, space eventually becomes unstable like boiling water. When you heat up water, eventually it starts to boil and bubbles form. Little bubbles form and these bubbles expand. So if you have an oven and you heat the oven to trillions upon trillions of degrees, little bubbles are going to form. These bubbles are baby universes. And then the next question is, is that dangerous? Are they going to expand and eat up your universe? Well, no. It turns out that if I have a soap bubble, and the soap bubble starts to spin off a baby soap bubble, the baby soap bubble bulges out in the third dimension. That is, it doesn't take over the original bubble at all. It bulges out into a baby bubble. So instead of one bubble, you know, have two bubbles that are joined together. And that's what you're asking. What happens at the joint between two universes? First of all, what would you see? If you have an oven and you heat it up to a fantastic uh, degree of energy, a sphere. A sphere would start to form, which is a baby universe. But the sphere, instead of expanding into your universe, expands into another universe on the other side of forever. In other words, in another dimension. So what do you see? You see your oven getting hotter and hotter. A bubble starts to form. A three-dimensional sphere starts to form. But the sphere only expands to a certain degree and then blows out. Blows out the other end. Can you see the other end? No. Because then it's in another dimension. What you see is a, a bubble that starts to create a baby universe inside its insides. And then I asked him, well, Alan, this is very interesting, but how dangerous? How dangerous is this bubble universe that you just created inside your oven in your, in your, in your backyard or your basement? And he said, well, he did the calculation. Yes, it is dangerous. Yes, you would still feel the effects, and the energy of the recoil would be equivalent to a small hydrogen bomb. So in other words, get the hell out of there. Create the bubble, but run like crazy, because even though the other universe is bulging out in another dimension, the residual energy would be enough to kill you. So in other words, be careful if you make a baby universe in your basement and you become a god. Okay, well, let's move on to the next listener phone call. Well, we had a question before the break, and the question is rather advanced, so let me try to break it down. First of all, what do I do for a living? My paycheck comes from the city and state of New York because I work on something called string theory. String theory, we think, is a theory that eluded Einstein for the last 30 years of his life, a theory of everything. Each vibration of a tiny, tiny, tiny little string corresponds to a subatomic particle, and that's why we have so many subatomic particles. So physics is now reduced to the laws of harmony of vibrating strings. Chemistry is the melodies you can write on vibrating strings. The universe is a symphony of strings. And then the mind of God, the mind of God that eluded Einstein for the last 30 years of his life, the mind of God would be cosmic music resonating through hyperspace, 10 dimensional hyperspace. Now we live in a three dimensional universe, but there could be hidden dimensions out there because if our universe is a bubble of some sort, even children ask the question, what is the bubble expanding into? Well, our bubble is expanding into hyperspace. We think 10 dimensional hyperspace. But the questioner asked, how come I sometimes say 11-dimensional hyperspace? Well, let me explain. In 10 dimensions, we have five string theories that are totally self-consistent and qualify for a theory of everything. Now, we don't like that. We think the universe should be unique in some sense. So why should the universe create not one, but five mathematically self-consistent universes? It sounds a little strange, right? Well, Ed Witten at Princeton 
found out the reason why. If you go to one more dimension up into the 11th dimension, and then you squeeze it, you squash one of the dimensions, what do you get? You get 10-dimensional string theory. So think of a beach ball. Think of a beach ball and think of the equator, the rim of the beach ball, and then flatten it out into a pancake. If you flatten the beach ball so that it loses one dimension and becomes a flat pancake, it looks like the equator, that is, a string. So in other words, a string is a collapsed beach ball, a collapsed membrane. So then the question is, if I live in 11-dimensional hyperspace and I have a membrane or a beach ball, how many ways can you squeeze it? Well, you got to talk to a mathematician for that. But the answer is five ways. There are five ways you can squeeze a beach ball so that it becomes the equator, that is, a string. Well, bingo! Why do we have five string theories in ten dimensions? Because they really are the same thing. This blew the minds of the world's physicists realizing that the five string theories that we work with for 30 years is actually one object, an 11-dimensional membrane of some sort. I like to think of it as an elephant. Think of an elephant. If you were to analyze the trunk of an elephant, you'd say the trunk looks like a two-dimensional object. If you look at the ears of the elephant, you say it looks like a fan. You put it all together and you get a very strange object. Many ways to create an elephant by looking at the feet, the trunk, the nose. So you would say that there really are five different animals. One animal looks like a tree, that is the feet. One animal looks like a snake, that is, the nose. One animal looks like a fan, that is, the ear. But what is it? Is it five different objects? No, it's one. It's an elephant. So in the same way, we think that in 11 dimensions, there is one object that when you slice it up, gives you five different string theories. And so, to make a long story short, this dazzled the world of physics, realizing that maybe the universe is unique. Maybe there's one and only one way to create a universe that satisfies all the criteria that we need to create a unified field theory. Well, the questioner also had another question about four-dimensional bubbles. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to listen to all of it, but let me explain really briefly what he was getting at. Why does the universe expand? The universe expands because there's something called dark energy pushing the galaxies apart. So even nothingness has energy, dark energy, and it pushes the galaxy apart. And the question is, can string theory explain this? Well, yes and no. It turns out that if you simply calculate one way in which to derive a four-dimensional universe from string theory, there are many ways to do it. In one way, you can get our universe. But, to be fair, there are other ways of reducing the 11-dimensional theory down to four dimensions. So there is more than one universe. This is called the multiverse theory, and it means that in some sense, string theory cannot yet calculate exactly the amount of dark energy in the universe unless you put it in by hand, and we don't like that. So in other words, string theory is not finished yet. It's not in its finished mathematical form. And if you were listening to this show, perhaps one day you, you may have that insight to allow us to complete the theory and calculate exactly the amount of dark energy in the universe. Maybe somebody listening to this show will one day figure out the theory of everything. Okay, well, let's move right on to the next listener phone call. Hi, Dr. Clarkie. This is Ken. I'm calling to ask if um, 
it's possible to have more than two time dimensions. I know that time can move perpendicular to each other. Is it possible to have like three or four time dimensions or infinite dimensions? Or is there any other kinds of like, um, like, uh, elements of, uh, the cosmos beyond space or time or space time? Thank you for your time. Well, at first, that question sounds weird, preposterous, and stupid. Actually, it's a subject of intense debate among theoretical physicists. You see, string theory, which is the leading theory for the theory of everything, has nine spatial dimensions, dimensions that you can move in, and one time dimension. Okay, you got that? 9 plus 1 equals 10. That's string theory. However, at Harvard, we have another group that says that if you allow for two times, not one, but two times, then the theory becomes even prettier and even more elegant in 12-dimensional hyperspace. So if the mind starts to boggle at that point. What would a two-time universe look like? Well, once I saw a movie on one of these old uh, movie stations, and David Niven, the British actor, got shot down over the Atlantic, and he went to heaven. However, in heaven, when uh, St. Peter began to write down what we knew about this guy, heaven found out it made a mistake. He wasn't supposed to die. Well, we'll talk about that after the break. Well, before the break, we had a call concerning dark energy, so let me explain really quick. It turns out that even nothingness, pure nothingness, has a small amount of energy associated with it. Now, some crackpots claim that they can use that energy to create a solution to the energy crisis. Nope, doesn't work that way. You can calculate that the zero-point energy is very small, very, very tiny. But over galactic distances, it, of course, is very big because space is very big. And that energy is sufficient to push the galaxies apart. In fact, that's why the Big Bang is banging. That's why the universe is expanding but the calculation of dark energy has eluded physicists up to now. What is the mismatch? The mismatch between theory and experiment is 10 to the 120. Now take out a sheet of paper, write down the number 1, and then write 120 zeros after that 1. That's the mismatch between theory and experiment. Now. That's embarrassing. I mean, this is the biggest embarrassment in all of science. The biggest mismatch in all of science is 10 to the 120, one with 120 zeros after it. The mismatch between the experimental value of dark energy and the theoretical value of dark energy. So what are you going to do? If you ever find a solution to the dark energy problem, you're going to call me and, well, I'm a generous man, I'll split the Nobel Prize with you. Okay? That's what it's worth. It's worth the Nobel Prize if you can figure out why dark energy is so dark and so energetic. Okay, well, let's move right on now to the next listener phone call. Hello, Professor Tucker. This is Jesse from Houston. I watch you on YouTube. I've asked a couple questions already, and you straightened me out on some of them. Um, I had another question about uh, future humanity. I just saw your podcast, uh, the one that you recently put on YouTube, and you had an interview, and I think it was in 2015 or something. But anyway, you were talking about your book, Future Humanity. And uh, I had a question about future humanity. Um, like, when we eventually go to Mars... When people, regular people are on Mars, not just astronauts or scientists, regular people on Mars, what kind of regulations do you think there will be in place for Mars? Is it going to be a new slate? Is it going to be like, okay, no drugs, no, um, you know, no, no this, no that, like the problems on Earth? Or um, is it going to be sort of the same rules, same regulations as Earth? Or is it going to be a, a whole new process because it's a whole new planet? You know, we, we can start clean or whatever. 
we had a call about what it would be like to live on Mars. Would we have the same kinds of laws, restrictions, and uh, you can't do this, you can't do that, rules of thumb? Or would it be freer on Mars? Well, yes and no. In some sense, things are going to be more restrictive if you are a colonist on Mars. In other ways, you'll have more freedom than you can possibly imagine. Initially, there are going to be lots of restrictions if you live as a colonist on Mars. But eventually, there could be unparalleled freedoms as well. Now, let's be clear about this. If you are one of the early colonists on Mars, you cannot pollute. You cannot danger endanger the entire colony by being wasteful and doing dangerous things. So, for example, smoking or getting access to oxygen in a very secure area. You could cause a fire, an explosion, which would be disastrous absolutely disastrous in a small colony. You can endanger all the colonists. And you have to make sure that you eat a certain amount of food because you don't want to exhaust the food supply of the colony. And you don't want to pollute. Especially you don't want to pollute because it's going to pollute the water supply, which is very precious on Mars. So initially, there are going to be lots of restrictions, common sense restrictions, in order to preserve the safety of the entire colony. One little mistake can expose you to a loss of oxygen, to fires, to a loss of uh, food, and create problems that endanger the entire colony. However, that said, ultimately, there could be a freedom unparalleled since the days of the pioneers. Realize that Mars is wide open wide open, just like the early colonists found things wide open when they explored new territories. And there could be new ventures in tourist areas, in areas that are spectacular compared to areas on the planet Earth. For example, mountains of Mars would be much taller than mountains on the Earth. Mount Everest would look rather puny on Mars because of the weak gravitational field, meaning that mountains can become much larger than mountains here found on the planet Earth. So the Grand Canyon of Mars, for example, is about the size of the United States of America. Now think about that for a moment. Our Grand Canyon is a dot on a map compared to the size of the United States. However, on Mars, the East Grand Canyon, the Mars Mariner Valley, is roughly the size of the United States of America. So you can see that there are volcanoes, mountain ranges, canyons, much bigger and more spectacular than anything found on the planet Earth. And you are free, free to explore these things in a way that you cannot explore on the planet Earth. Okay, let's move on now to the next listener phone call. This is Lee from Bozeman, Montana, listening to KNMS 1450. I'm curious about um, shooting stars. How can we see a star that is shooting across the sky? Thank you. Okay, well, that shooting star that you see whipping across the sky is not really a star at all. It's a small piece of debris, perhaps the size of a marble or maybe the size of a table, and it is burning up when it hits the atmosphere of the planet Earth. So the meteor itself is the streak of light that goes across the heavens. It only lasts for about a second or so, and it burns up because it's a piece of rock, probably from the asteroid belt, that heats up because of the friction when it encounters the air of the Earth. Now, stars are totally different. Our entire Earth, for example, orbits around our sun. Our sun is a star. In fact, it's a rather typical star. But stars light up the heavens. So unlike meteors, which only dance across the night sky for a second or so, stars burn for billions of years. And that's eventually where we came from. Okay, well, let's take another short commercial. Okay, let's move on now to the next listener phone call. Hello, my name is Jeremy Yav. I'm from Chicago. 
Um, I just want to ask, how much energy is in the universe? Thanks. Well, you ask an embarrassing question, and I'll try to make a stab at it. First of all, we don't even know the size of the universe. Um, we know the density of the universe, that is how much energy and matter there is in a cubic centimeter. So, for example, if you were to have a piece of gas and highlight every molecule in that gas and make every molecule the size of, let's say, a basketball, that would be the rough the rough density of space-time. So you realize that the Earth is an exception. We're quite dense here on the planet Earth, but in outer space, hydrogen atoms are only as common as basketballs. And so that's how rare the density of the, Earth, the, of the universe is. Then the next question is, well, how big is the entire universe? We don't really know. However, inflation theory is the most uh, rigorous theory of the Big Bang. Inflation theory is actually compatible both with the universe starting from a dot as well as the universe starting from an infinite sheet. So to answer your question, we really don't even know how big the universe is. And then the question is, what is the total amount of matter energy in the universe? That, we think, could be very close to zero. So let me explain. Matter has positive energy, energy to do work. Gravity has negative energy because you have to add energy in order to go into empty space. Now, how much positive and negative energy is there? Well, it's very close to zero. That is, the total amount of matter and energy in the universe is very close to zero. So it takes no energy to create a baby universe. Now, in string theory, we believe in a multiverse of universes. Some people have criticized that. They say that that's very wasteful, because where is all the energy going to come from to populate all these other universes? But you see, that misses the point. The net energy of each universe is probably zero. The total amount of space in the universe and the total amount of matter in the universe add up. And when you add up those two, you get zero. So, in other words, we don't really know the answer to your question. The best we can say is... We know the average density of the universe and the total amount of energy in the entire universe, including matter, could be zero. So the embarrassing thing is we have no definitive answer yet to your question. A lot of theories, but no definitive answer. Okay, let's move on to the next listener phone call. Hey, this is Brandon from Manhattan, and I was wondering, what are Fermi bubbles? I read something about it. I'm not really sure exactly what they're about, but um, I'm also listening to you on YouTube, and I love your show, and have a great day. Bye. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, I'm not exactly sure precisely what you mean, because it could refer to several things, but let me explain. Enrico Fermi was one of the great quantum physicists who helped to create what we call nuclear physics. For example, he created the first nuclear reactor at the University of Chicago. He helped to build the atomic bomb. And he realized that there are two kinds of particles, fermions and bosons. A fermion is like an electron. Its spin is one half of Planck's constant. So the electron spins, and it's a very small amount, but it is consistent with what is called a fermion. So an electron, a proton, and a quark are all fermions. However, there are also bosons. Bosons have integer spins, not a half, but one, two, and three. So we have two kinds of particles. One particle that makes up matter, the electrons, the protons, these are the fermions. And then we have the bosons, which make up the forces. Light and gravity are made out of bosons. Phone call. Hello. My name is Chris from Cupertino, California. My question relates to reactionless propulsion. And when I say reactionless, 
I do not mean any false impressions like electromagnetic levitation, centrifugal force, or anti-gravity, etc. Today, if I tell anyone about a concept for reactionless propulsion, everyone suggests me to first develop a theory which would be hundreds of times harder than just conducting the experiment and finding it out. On the other hand, whenever we enabled frictionless motion, I mean invention of wheel, the actual theory was followed thousands of years later. Why is this contrast? Has the theoretical advancement become a barrier to non-incremental experimentation, especially because current theories, which by the way are great for incremental stuff, but we do not know whether they will even turn out to be consistent with the reactionless propulsion or not. Your thoughts, please. Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, I'll give you a, a reaction to your question about a reactionless propulsion, and then I'll give you some advice about what to do with your theory. First of all, we have Newton's three laws of motion, and reactionless propulsion would violate the third law. Let's go through the three laws very simply. The first law of motion, you know if you go ice skating, and that is an object in motion, stays in motion unless acted on by an outside force. So if I have an ice puck, for example, and I throw it on, a, on an ice rink, it seems to go on forever. In fact, it will go on forever if it wasn't for friction, which is an outside force. So in outer space, if you are in motion in outer space, in principle, you go forever without stopping. And that's how our space probes can go all the way out to Pluto and beyond. They coast. They coast once they're in outer space. They don't need rocket fuel. They don't need large amounts of gasoline to reach Pluto. No, they simply coast because there's no friction in outer space. The second law of Newton is force is equal to mass times acceleration. That gives us equations by which we can calculate the tensions on a bridge, the tensions in a rocket ship, and the tensions in the Empire State Building. You know, when I was a kid growing up in California, I used to hear about the Empire State Building, and I used to wonder, how can they build the Empire State Building without knowing ahead of time if it's going to fall down? I mean, you can't make a model, right, of the Empire State Building that's realistic. So how do they know it's not going to fall down? Well, the answer is we have Newton's second law of motion. And that allows you to calculate the stresses on every single brick inside the Empire State Building. In fact, now that I teach physics, I actually give students problems like that, calculate the tensions inside a bridge. Next, we have Newton's third law of motion, which deals with reaction. The third law of motion is known to every child who's ever blown up a balloon. When you release the air on the balloon, the balloon goes shooting out in the opposite direction. So air goes in one way, out the nozzle, and the balloon goes the other direction. That is action-reaction. Now, what this listener proposes is a reactionless propulsion. That is propulsion like a rocket ship without the rocket, that is, without the exhaust. Now, that'd be great. For example, if I have a reactionless propulsion for a gun, I can shoot the gun and not feel the recoil. But if you ever fired a gun, and I fired many guns because I was in the United States military for about two years, when I fired machine guns when I was in the military, I realized that there was a back reaction on my shoulder. And therefore, you have to sort of grit your teeth knowing that when you fire a machine gun, you're going to get that rapid fire reaction on your shoulder, which could actually hurt. Now, same thing with rockets. If you have a reactionless propulsion system, it means you can have the rocket without the fuel. <laughs> In other words, it would take off pretty much all by itself because you need the fuel for action and then the reaction is motion in the forward direction. Well, so far we see no violation of Newton's third law of motion. We have skyscrapers, rockets, bulldozers, buildings. At no point do we see a violation of Newton's third law of motion. 
That's why some people think that the search for a reactionless propulsion is futile. Now, let's say you have a theory then what are you going to do about it? Some people are hesitant to publish that theory because then your rivals will scoop you and steal your invention. Well, what you ought to do is several things. One, get a patent. In fact, you may want to consult with a patent attorney to get that patent. However, many patents, many um, patent officers require a model that works. Well, let me take a short commercial break. And after that break, I'll give you a word of advice if you have a great invention and you want to make sure that no one steals your idea. Well, before the break, we had a question about reactionless propulsion. Many people have tried to create that because then you could basically have motion without the rocket fuel. Think about that. Rockets without rocket fuel. However, Newton's has the last word. For every action, there's a reaction. And we know that because we've tested it on rockets, airplanes, we've tested it on bulldozers, skyscrapers. Every time there's an action, there is a reaction. And that's codified in something called the conservation of momentum. So, sorry about that. If you want an inventor, I would suggest you try to invent something else other than something that violates Newton's third law of motion. However, if you do have a theory, what are the steps that you should pursue? Well, first of all, you may want to take a patent out on it. However, I warn you that if you have a patent for a perpetual motion machine, usually they ask for a demonstration model. So many people over the centuries have claimed to have created a perpetual motion machine. Energy from nothing. In fact, in antiquity, going back thousands of years, enterprising inventors would go to the king and claim that they can get energy for free. Usually it was some kind of spinning wheel of some sort. And of course, because of friction, you basically lose energy and have to add energy from the outside. But anyway, over thousands of years, people have tried to get inventions uh, sponsored by the king, in which case they could become millionaires in the process. However, after centuries of analyzing all these perpetual motion machines, we physicists have come to the conclusion that there's something called the conservation of energy, which in turn is a byproduct of Newton's laws of motion. So in other words, the patent office will ask you for a demonstration model. Don't just think you can create something in the laboratory and become an instant millionaire. However, I do suggest that if you do have an idea, patent it. Talk to a patent attorney, or if you simply want recognition for your idea and not necessarily to commercialize it, publish it in a magazine. There are several magazines you can submit it to. There's Physical Review, which is the magazine of my organization, the American Physical Society. It is the premier American physics magazine, Physical Review. There's also a European magazine, Nuclear Physics, for example, uh, published by Elsevier Publishers in, in, in Europe. They are one of the leading publishers of nuclear information um, papers in the nuclear field. So if you have an idea and you don't want to patent it, but you want recognition for that theory, then you may want to send it to these magazines and then you will get a referee. Sometimes more than one referee. In fact, I referee other people's papers all the time. Magazines send me articles to referee for their for their magazine. In fact, just last week, I got a uh, article that um, a magazine wanted me to referee an article about astronautics of interstellar space travel. So those are the paths you can take if you have an idea and you don't want someone else to steal that idea. By the way, don't take it personally. The, sometimes the referees can be brutal, but they'll be honest with you. The referee will tell you honestly why they think your idea is great or why it's a bunch of nonsense. Okay, let's move on now to the next listener phone call. Uh, so you know how you can lose a dream? Oh, this is uh, Armand again from Queens. I listen to on YouTube. Uh, so you know how you lose a dream? I was wondering um, is it, if there's a... The one day you think there'll be technology to make you able to control your dreams 
while you're sleeping so you can actually function on like a vir- in a virtual world while you're sleeping while you're getting like a good night deep sleep all right thank you very much for that and uh i love your show and have a great day bye Okay, good. Well, just a few years ago, if you were to ask a question to a scientist about lucid dreaming, they would have considered you to be a crackpot. Well, not anymore. Lucid dreaming, that is the idea that you can control the progress of a dream, is actually correct. There are lucid dreamers who have been subjected to an MRI scan. When they fall asleep, they fall asleep inside an MRI machine that analyzes blood flow. It turns out that when you dream, the blood to the prefrontal cortex, which is the thinking part of your brain behind your forehead, shuts down. That's why your dreams become fantastic. They violate all the laws of logic, not just the laws of physics. They violate the laws of logic because the front part of your brain is drained of blood when you dream. And then MRI scans show that the center part of your brain, that is the amygdala, lights up like a Christmas tree. And that's the seat of nightmares, the seat of emotions, the amygdala. And that's one reason why many of your dreams are nightmarish. So it turns out that people who are lucid dreamers have an active prefrontal cortex while the amygdala lights up. Both areas of the brain light up. So in other words, it's true. Not only that, but when you dream, you are paralyzed. So how do you talk to someone who's a lucid dreamer? You you give them a piece of electrode on, in their hand, and you ask them to squeeze it. Even though they are paralyzed when they dream, they have the ability to squeeze gently an electrode in their hand. And that's how you can communicate. That's how you can actually talk to someone who's dreaming and communicate with them. And they can communicate with you by squeezing this electrode. This has actually been done now at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, Germany. They put a German who claimed to be a lucid dreamer inside the machine and bingo, the prefrontal cortex was fully lit up even as he was in REM dreaming state. So in other words, lucid dreaming is scientifically possible. Then the next question is, how do you become a lucid dreamer? It turns out that Buddhist texts going back centuries have given people lessons as to how to become a lucid dreamer so that you can control the direction of your dreams. You can Google it. Some of these things are common sense. One is that just before you go to bed, you have a notebook. You see, when you wake up, Right after a dream, you forget the dream within a matter of seconds. Within a matter of seconds, the memory of that dream simply disappears forever. So have a notebook. Write down the dream. Get in the habit of writing down the dream as soon as you have it, as soon as you wake up. Second, prime yourself. That is, before going to bed, say to yourself, I'm going to be a lucid dreamer tonight. I'm going to be awake I'm going to control the direction of my dream. So get in that frame of mind that you are going to control the direction of your dream when you dream that night. Now, of course, we can't guarantee that you're going to become a lucid dreamer. However, the lessons are centuries old as to how to control the direction of your dreams. This is not science fiction anymore. We actually can do it now in the laboratory. Okay, let's move on to the next listener phone call. Hi, Dr. Kaku. My name is Tim. Um, I'm calling you from Dallas, Texas. My question regards dark matter. Is dark matter just matter that we cannot observe via uh, visible light, or is it just something nebulous and unknown in the universe. I know that it makes up so much of the universe, and we, we don't know very much about it. So your thoughts on the matter ha, would be, would be uh, very well appreciated. Thank you very much. 
Okay, good question. Well, every high school textbook has to be rewritten. All the high school textbooks say that the universe is basically made out of atoms, but that's not true anymore. We know that there's something called dark matter, which outweighs ordinary matter by a factor of maybe up to 10. Now, how do we know that? First of all, the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, well, unfortunately, I have to take a short commercial break. Okay, let's move on now to the next listener. Oh, by the way, I forgot. I have to answer the question about dark matter before we move on. Dark matter was first found by astronomers decades ago, but it was dismissed because it was too preposterous. For example, the Milky Way galaxy spins. It looks like a pinwheel, in fact, but it spins 10 times too fast. By rights, it should fly apart. In which case, the Earth should have been flung into outer space uh, billions of years ago. But the Milky Way galaxy is quite stable, and we see these galaxies everywhere in the universe that are very stable, but all of them are spinning about 10 times too fast. Either this means that Newton was wrong, and we are very reluctant to give on Newton's laws of gravity. Either Newton was wrong, or there's a new form of matter in a halo surrounding the galaxy, keeping the galaxy intact, preventing it from flying apart. That's dark matter. Now we have maps of dark matter. Dark matter is invisible, because when you photograph these galaxies, we don't see a halo around these galaxies at all. We just see a pinwheel. But they're stable, and they spin 10 times too fast, and we now have maps of dark matter. When light goes through glass, it bends light. So how do you know that there's glass inside your glasses? Well, glass is invisible. So how do you know that there's glass inside your glasses? Because light bends when it goes through your glass, and that's why you have eyeglasses. Same thing with dark matter. When light goes through this invisible matter, it bends. Then, using a computer, we can calculate how much dark matter there is by calculating how much bending of light there is. And you can Google it. You can actually see maps of dark matter reconstructed using computers looking at the bending of starlight. For the break, we had a question about something that is requiring us to rewrite all the high school textbooks, and that is the presence of dark matter. What is it? And why, why should we care? Well, first of all, as we mentioned before, we have maps of dark matter, which surrounds the Milky Way galaxy, holding the galaxy together so that it doesn't fly apart. And the next question is, what is dark matter made of? Well, the short answer is we don't know. There's a Nobel Prize waiting for that person who could finally tell us what dark matter is. However, there are many theories. The leading theory is that it's a new particle. We call it the photino, a particle that is the companion to the photon, which is a particle of light. The photino is invisible, is predicted by a theory called string theory, which is what I do for a living, and it is plentiful and invisible, but has mass. These are exactly the characteristics you want dark matter to have. You want it to have gravity, so it holds the galaxy together. You want it to be invisible, because we don't see anything with our telescopes when we look for that halo surrounding the galaxy. And this particle is predicted by string theory. String theory has not been proven, but it simply says that all matter consists of vibrations. Vibrations of a tiny rubber band when the rubber band vibrates in different frequencies, you get different subatomic particles. Now, why don't scientists all uniformly agree with string theory? It's a controversial theory. Among, the th among other things, it states that the universe is not three-dimensional at all. We think that everything is three-dimensional. You can describe everything by its length, width, and height. However, string theory says that there are 11 dimensions, that our universe is a bubble floating in a much larger hyperspace universe. That's controversial. That's why some people don't like string theory at all, because it forces you to confront a many worlds. The idea that our universe is not just one bubble that's expanding, an idea given to us by Einstein, but there could be many bubbles out there, a multiverse of universes. 
Now, there is another way to explain dark matter, and that is, if there are these other universes, then matter can exist, stars can exist in these other universes. If these two universes are close together, we would feel the effect of gravity from this other universe, but it would be invisible, because light can only move in our bubble. Therefore, if you hover in hyperspace, you are invisible, but you exert gravity. But that's exactly what dark matter is. It's invisible, but exerts gravity. Now, that is a pretty wild theory, a theory that we are very close to a parallel universe where there are parallel galaxies out there, and that's what causes the halo. Well, personally, I believe in the first theory, that is, for the photino, that is, the particle of the photon, is the origin of dark matter. And why should we care? Well, first of all, we are here today because of dark matter. If it wasn't for dark matter, the galaxy would have been split apart, would have been flung apart billions of years ago. And if it does turn out that dark matter makes is consisted of these higher resonances of the string, it'll prove one of the greatest theories of all time. That string theory is, in fact, the theory of everything. The theory that explains the entire universe. The fabled unified field theory, the theory of everything. But that's another story. Okay, let's move on now to the next listener phone call. Hello, sir. This is Bear, uh, spelled B-A-I-R, uh, Bear Cloth. Um, I found uh, your question on Twitter, and I'm from Medford, Massachusetts. And my science question is, in this universe, is a black hole the other side of a Big Bang in a different universe? Thanks. Well, at first, your idea sounds ridiculous and preposterous, but actually, there are physicists, colleagues of mine, who actually pu publish papers in this idea. And this idea is very simple, and that is, if we have black holes, why can't we have white holes? In fact, Stephen Hawking wrote papers on this, the fact that somewhere in the universe, there should be the opposite of a black hole, which is a white hole. A white hole, instead of emitting, instead of absorbing matter, actually... Uh, excretes matter, shoots matter out. And then the question is, is a white hole on the other side of a black hole? Well, we'll talk about that after the break. For the break, we had a question about white holes. So let me explain. First of all, the laws of physics can run forward or backwards in time. For example, if I get a motion picture and I reverse the direction of time, then, well, bizarre things happen. Food comes out of your mouth and reforms to give you breakfast right in front of you. Uh, dead people come out of graves and reassemble to become living people. So if you ran the videotape backwards, it would be very strange, but possible. Unlikely, highly unlikely that food will come out of your mouth and reform to create the fry gag that you had this morning, but possible. So if you have a black hole that absorbs matter like a vacuum cleaner, then a white hole should also be possible. Unlikely, but possible. But we've looked for white holes and we have not found any at all. But white holes are actually rather convenient because if everything falls into a black hole, then maybe it spews out the other end as a white hole in another universe. Now, this idea was actually made possible by Einstein himself. In 1935, he asked himself a simple question. If you fall into a black hole, does all matter basically die at that point? What happens to the matter? Maybe it funnels out into a, another universe. So think of a black hole as being a funnel. A funnel where everything comes in, nothing comes out. But on the other end of the funnel, there's a reverse funnel that's upside down and is attached to the original funnel. So you have two funnels. One funnel, which is the black hole, which absorbs everything, and the other funnel shoots out matter, and that's the white hole. And then several of my colleagues have said, maybe that's the Big Bang. Maybe the Big Bang is really connected to a parent universe. Now, as bizarre as this sounds, this is compatible with an idea called inflation. And inflation, in turn, is the leading theory of the Big Bang. 
It turns out that, uh, well, Alan Guth at MIT proposed the idea of inflation several decades ago. It fits the data. He may eventually win the Nobel Prize for this theory called inflation, which says that our universe can peel off baby universes. So think of a soap bubble, and the soap bubble can peel off baby soap bubbles, and you have this continual peeling off of baby universes. In other words, big bangs are happening all the time. Every time you have a peeling off of a baby universe, a black hole becomes a white hole. As preposterous as this sounds, it is compatible with all the data. When you look at the data from our Big Bang, it is compatible with the idea that these Big Bangs happen all the time. Now, does that prove it? No. It only shows that our particular universe seems to have originated from a peeling process from a parent universe, but it is not proof. Proof, we may have to go to another satellite called LISA, Laser Interferometry Space Antenna, which is going to be a gravity wave detector in outer space, which may give us baby pictures of the instant of creation. The instant of creation, the exact microsecond when the baby universe emerged out of the womb, and the hope is will detect evidence of an umbilical cord, an umbilical cord that connects our our baby universe to a parent universe. Sounds crazy? Yeah, but hey, this is what we do for a living. We physicists look at the data, and no matter where the data takes us, that's where we go. And so far, our data takes us in the direction of inflation, which in turn makes possible a multiverse of universes. Okay, let's move on now to the next listener phone call. Hi, my name is Fred Kushner. I'm uh, in Colorado. I'm not currently listening to, but I do listen to our uh, Colorado Public Broadcasting Station. And my question is, if the maximum speed limit for any object or electromagnetic radiation in space-time is the speed of light, why is it that space-time itself can expand faster than the speed of light? That would be wonderful if we could answer that question for me. I'm confused. Okay, well, Einstein's statement that nothing can go faster than the speed of light is slightly incorrect. A more precise statement would be nothing material can go faster than the speed of light. You see, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. I repeat, nothingness can go faster than the speed of light. In other words, nothing can stretch faster than the speed of light. Now, the Big Bang was when we had this explosion of a tiny area which stretched to give us the universe of today. And that stretching process was not material. It was just emptiness. Empty space can expand faster than the speed of light. But material objects cannot go faster than the speed of light. So, for example, uh, here's an example from my youth. When I was a kid, I used to take a flashlight and I would sweep across the night sky with the flashlight. The flashlight went from one end of the universe to the other end of the universe, thousands and thousands of light years in the other direction. And I said to myself, now wait a minute, I just violated Einstein's theory of relativity because the image that sweeps across the sky is going faster than the speed of light. Well, I'm a physicist now, and now I realize that, yes, the image went faster than the speed of light, but material objects, that is photons, particles of light, each particle of light did not go faster than the speed of light. Here's another example. Let's say I have a bomber that drops a whole bunch of bombs in a string. And I'm on the ground, and I watch all these bombs hit the ground. Each bomb is moving very slowly as it slowly falls toward the Earth. But when I look at the image point, the image point of where the bombs hit the ground and then rapidly go bum, 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 bum in a line, I realize that that can go faster than the velocity of the bomb itself. So in other words, the image can go faster than the speed of light because it's not material, but not the bomb itself.